we are going to work a little bit through um, some of the music um, of Martin Luther. The interesting thing about music, in a way, it kind of brings together a lot of different um, things that we've already learned about somewhat. Because um, with the history, and especially the theology of Luther, which we did, what, four weeks ago, I guess, three or four weeks ago, um, this is kind of a chance to revisit some of that by looking at it through the lens of music. Um, and um, I, it's not my area as much of expertise, but over at First Lutheran, um, Sarah and Eric Billings, who's uh, Pastor Kayla's husband, he graduated from um, Wartburg, Wartburg <laughs> down in uh, Waverly, Iowa with a um, degree in music. And he did a bunch of research on Martin Luther and his relationship to music. They couldn't be here this morning, but he gave me some trusty notes. <laughs> then I looked up a bunch of stuff myself. And we, so I'm kind of combining a lot of different things here. We also are going to be using some technology. So hopefully you Zoomers will have to let us know if you can't hear or if something is unclear. Um, we will try to... Um, We'll try to fix it. Uh, we'll be listening to some music from that era, as well as uh, just seeing some different aspects of um, Luther and how music played a role in the Reformation early on. So there's a lot of um, things to kind of unpack. And this is a uh, topic that you could spend a semester on, not just in the German department, but in music as well, or in religion, because it all has implications for, um, for, for our, all those areas, right? So it's one of those things that could um, have a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in a lot of different areas. And if you are interested in coming along on our, on our trip next year, we would hope to be able to hit a concert or two in, especially in Leipzig. Um, they have very, it's a very famous uh, music area and they would uh, be, uh, they, they do quite a few concerts in, um, in that area. There's lots of different musical groups. And so actually throughout the whole Luther area, there's a lot of music, which brings me to the point of Luther himself and his own personal musical background. Now we're going to try to finish a little early. I think you had a couple of minutes you uh, wanted at the I end. Need, yes, I do. I, okay. I need to share briefly what uh, Pastor Sue's sharing in an hour. Okay. <laughs> so we will, um, don't, so cut me off if I start getting a little too long and you really need to jump in. Um, all right. I've made arrangements to have a guard outside. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. All right, yeah, maybe with a big plug. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to start. I'm going to start out with some of Eric's. Eric's, I had written out a few questions that I personally had about this topic, and then Eric filled in some of it. I was able to look up a few things, and um, and Sarah uh, is a, the organist and musician over at First Lutheran, and so she also kind of weighed in on some. Um, but first, my first question was, what about Luther? What what did he why was he so interested in music and what um was he a musician himself you know did he play an instrument what kind of um background did he have in music and uh, according to both the internet but eric was able to tell me i was not off base um he was a tenor who sang he sang tenor he played both the loop <laughs> A lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He's a tenor who's saying, what, wait, uh, what is the inside joke on that? I'm not musically. Oh, okay. Most of us Lutherans don't sing high tenor. Okay. Okay. But okay. Luther did. Okay. okay. Yeah, so he was unique. Right. Tenors tend, to, tenors tend to be kind of, if, you're, if you know opera, the tenor tends to be the, the kind of diva of the male voice era <laughs> or that group. So it's sort of often the hero is the is the tenor, but not not always, but often <laughs> that um, if you uh, anybody uh, opera fan opera fans here, I like opera. I mean, I like <laughs> it. I like to touch on everything. <laughs> I know. So uh, yeah, so, I don't know much about it. 
Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Tremendous. We do. Yeah. yeah. The, the red. The red. Corey and Amanda Renmarker. Oh, oh okay. yeah. 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 He's Corey one of my colleagues at UT. Yeah, he is. He is. Um, in fact, he's they. He, and there's a CD release coming up, or do they already have it with um, Stephen Carlson? I think it might have been released. Yeah, doing the Vinta Weise. Yeah, that was a. So it's in. They sing. He sings in German. Uh -huh. So yeah. Wow. What is his name? Or what's Corey, Corey Renmarker? And then is that available somewhere? I believe so. It's a, it's an interesting, um, yeah, and it's interesting um, in, um, it's a, it would be, an, it's, it's not the most upbeat piece, <laughs> but it's an interesting, it's a very difficult piece. So it's, yeah. he's, it's very, very, um, yeah, very, 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 so this is a picture of a of a lute. So if for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, I will share it as soon as I get it to the right screen. All right. So this is a, a picture of a lute. Um, it was before. It was kind of the guitar before there were guitars. Um, the lutes were very popular in um, during the Renaissance. A lot of Renaissance music is written for lute. And um, the flute, which he apparently also played, I was going to try to find my version of it, but we just moved and I couldn't find it. But it's a, it's a, it would be a wooden flute. They didn't have the silver clair flute, which is a, where that you play this way. So he would have played it as a block flute, a recorder. So it would have been a wooden flute. Do you play the? Uh, not really, but okay. I pretend to. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So that is the lute and the flute. So that was his thing. He was born into a very musical family, apparently, and um, they really spent some time singing together. They enjoyed um, singing, and as a at, just at pastime, you know, sort of something to do. Um, he would have had formal musical instruction um, when he went to a Latin, the Latin school as a child. Um, musical instruction was kind of part of that particular curriculum. Um, it was important because you would learn lit Latin texts. Because Latin, you went to a Latin school yeah. as a child, um, you started learning lat liturgical Latin texts. And that was pretty much done just by rote. So it would be memorization of a Latin text. And not necessarily would the children know exactly what it all meant, but they would learn by rote. That was sort of the popular way of teaching. Um, they would have also had some, as he got older, some um, education in like music theory in that notation um, and kind of basic music theory, sort of like what you do in music class in school here today. Um, but things like sight singing, which they, the notation was slightly different than what we use today, but kind of similar. Um, and then older students were expected to be a part of the singing in the mass once they learned their Latin lit liturgies, because it was very important. So Luther went to university and he maybe had um, done some musical studies there because it was considered to be part of the, they had seven liberal arts and that was one of, music was one of them. Um, and that would have included things like um, harmonies, polyphony, so it's more than one line of, um, and composition. And they were also, um, folk music was a, was quite popular, um, whether you were in a, yeah, as a university student for sure, but even after you joined the monastery, um, people sang, that was part of what people did. Um, and, and when he became a monk, he would have been involved uh, in uh, daily the daily offices that happen as a monk. You'd have uh, various church services, liturgies that you were responsible for throughout the day, kind of set your day up. 
it in these different offices, uh, which were daily office that the monks would chant. It was a chant singing. Um, and he, as a priest, once he became ordained, he would have celebrated and led the mass actually, um, which really was something that people would, um, as priests and monks, it would you would know it by memory. It would be something that you would have learned, had to memorize, be able to pretty much recite it at verbatim as, as it were. So he, um, once he got married and um, he also had children and they were very popular. Um, he also enjoyed singing and playing music with his family. He had kids. And so that is um, a little bit about just Luther. I was interested to know what kind of um, a musician he was and how that developed. So that's um, kind of some notes on Luther himself. Personally, how that works. Yeah, Becky. Quick question for you, Lisa, or pastor, possibly for Pastor Ron. The liturgy, when you talk about liturgy, mm -hmm. is that the part of the sermon, like when Jeremiah, Pastor Jeremiah, sings to us at the sermon? Yeah. Is that okay? Thanks. It's part of the yeah, and it's sort of what the shape that the service takes. Mm -hmm. So there are certain components that are required within each liturgy okay so you'd start like the confession and the the curie or the you know lord mm -hmm. have mercy those are all parts of the of the uh, the liturgy okay. and um liturgical churches like lutheran churches anglican churches catholic churches still kind of celebrate a similar format and that creates this liturgy okay so as a monk back in the day when before things were printed, really, it was something that you would have memorized. And the people didn't read yet. And things we had talked about that earlier. And when we talked about history, it's a little bit um, different. So uh, the monks were the leaders of the service or the mass. And then the, and basically had responsibility for, for the whole mass. And then monks or professional singers would be singing the part that you were just talking about, maybe like the Kyrie or something. And I have some examples, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, here's the way the situation. Yeah, I think the word liturgy loosely translated is the work of the people. Mm -hmm. So liturgy is part of the service where the people get involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes as, sense. As over against a sermon where you just applaud right. at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you're Henry. Or not, but mostly, <laughs> yes, we all, we yeah, yeah. About it. but in general, so and the liturgy is something that you, you can like, you know, set your watch by. It's going to, that, and that was what the people, being it for the people, it would have this basically the same format. And then within each season of the church, it might change a little bit, but, you know, the words might be a little bit different if it's Advent versus Lent, for example. But in general, the format is going to be the same. There's going to be the confession and there's going to be the absolution. You know, there's there's a greeting. There, so it goes through the same steps and that's the liturgy. And then the pastor is able to, or priest, does the homily or sermon. And that's something that would be something separate, right? So the, the um, I was also curious to know what was, what changed, you know, as he was known as a theologian, also as a hymn writer. So why was this even important in the development of the church? Okay. I mean, if you, have, if you have someone who like writes news, I mean, that's great if it, it was just his hobby, but he was all, because he seemed to be a, really into the whole theology thing, right? Well, the, the whole hymn writing becomes part of what, um, in a way becomes, uh, it's part of the, his own, his theology really. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Before uh, music in the 15th century, between the church and the music that was used in the church versus how music was understood and used in society were two different things. So in the 15th century, um, so 1400, he was born in 1483, um, mass was very much the Roman rite, which is what they called it. Um, so the Catholic mass was sung only by professionals, only by the monks. It was always only sung in Latin. The, the practice dated back to the second century. It had evolved somewhat. 
um, through the centuries, but um, so this is now 12 centuries later, right? This had evolved. Um, and it had, re it, the result of the kind of evolution of it was it had, some of the music had gotten a little bit more complicated so that, for example, they would sing multiple notes. So like one word over maybe more than one note, which makes it harder and harder to kind of understand if you're not one of the singers. So it becomes a little bit more, more difficult. And honestly, it didn't matter because you didn't understand Latin. You common people would be like, you know, not Latin understand it. It was still, it was still super important that you actually went to mass, didn't sit down because they did not have any pews or way of you just stood and you listened to it being kind of coming down from on high and um you know with the priests the priest the monks would be chanting that and and using it like that so i have an example of what it would have sounded like and i'll see if i can get it to work now this is the thing where we're going to have to there might be some feedback so we'll see if we can so i'm going to share my screen and we'll just do a little bit and we'll see if we can get this to work who knows it's we're giving this a shot okay so i have to unmute myself ah, so you have to turn yours off okay all right and then i'm going to share okay okay so here, All right, so I'm going to stop the share there and we'll we'll come back. Oops, maybe I have to do my my mute. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it is a little bit. So that was some, that was some Gregorian chanting of an Alleluia, which is easier to understand because it's an Alleluia. But the um, the interesting thing is there's that there's that drone. Did you hear that kind of long yeah. that stays the same? And then the chanters are going up and down, and it's a single line. But at, throughout time, they had added like notes to one single word. So it was, ah, and so it gets longer and more involved for the listener to understand like, what am I actually saying? You know, as opposed to the one. So meanwhile, so that's how it was in the 1500s um, or yeah, the 1400s up through the, through Luther's time. So this is what you would have heard if you went to a mass and you would not have necessarily been very much involved. So the whole idea of literature being in the songs or whatever of the people was kind of the people. <laughs> but it was always a, you know, because they were being sung too, and you were involved in the listening of it, and but you weren't necessarily um so the Council of Trent happens and you know I was one of my questions and I don't know if there's people who have more um more experience. One of my questions is if so in 1545 was the Council of Trent. So this is now almost 20 years after the, the species get nailed to the wall. So it's, you know, and Luther has, Lutheranism is spreading. Um, and well, Protestantism is, in, yeah, as an idea is spreading more and more. Um, the Council of Trent is the Catholic Church. They uh, meet from 1545 to 1563, and they standardized the Latin Mass. So it had been evolving and a little bit they had used the same, but it became more standardized after the Council of Trent. 
which then, so my question is, do you think maybe if that was partly a reaction to the fact that there were these new ideas all cropping up and they're becoming more aware of the fact that they want to put like a kind of a grace, a vice grip on what their mass, what the church. Now, Luther liked mass. He was interested in keeping a liturgical service. He wasn't thinking that he was going to stop all of, you know, like the liturgy. He was interested in keeping that liturgy, keeping that format, right? Um, and um, so I don't know, the Council of Trent standardized it. Interestingly enough, the Latin mass continued as the primary Catholic rite until the, until actually um, Vatican II. So until 1959-1962, um, where it became more and more popular to use vernacular languages. Until then, Catholicism pretty much um, said you could do that, but the real mass was Latin, the Latin mass, and that had continued for centuries even with Protestantism kind of cropping up. I mean, it did affect it, of course, but. You're right, absolutely. The Council of Trent was that Connor Luther. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's what my essential, and so even musically, this is kind of an example of that, how the church was threatened, you know, and that's one way that they were reacting. So that is the Gregorian chant. So at the same time in folk music, and this is, this really affected Luther. Luther in his music, his music notation and what he really liked to do, he started writing more um, uh, using poly, polyphony, which is more than one line of music. So if you want, I'll play you a couple of kind of fun ones. Um, two really important, they're um, contemporaries of Luther, was Josquin Ducré, who wrote um, in, during the Renaissance, uh, wrote for the church as well. Um, and in German speaking areas, it was, um, he was kind of a pop star or a rock star. And then the other rock star was Heinrich Isaac, so Isaac. Um, and they both uh, lived and they lived, they were contemporaries of Luther, a little bit older than Luther. So they would have been like, you know, like, I don't know like Mick Jagger is to me or something, you know, just enough where there's a difference of age where he would have heard these um, rock stars and been influenced by some of their music. So I'd like to play it. So we're going to try this again. If you... Last one, um, the Gregorian chant. I'm hoping. We'll see. I'm going to see if I can get my... I feel like they weren't able to hear you. Were they? Did they put anything in the comments? No. Well, let's see. I am going to switch to a new. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, okay. I think I'm ready to share this now, and we'll see if it works. I'm unmuting. Okay. okay, so we'll see if this works. Okay, okay. oops. This needs to change. Becky, start off her sound. Okay. There we go. This is um, this is uh, El Grillo, which is uh, Josquin Dupré uh, piece about a cricket, and it's sung by Cantus, who's in, this is a uh, um, Minnesota group actually. We'll see here. Okay. So now I'm going to play another piece. Just leave it on because I'll just we'll move, move to the next. I don't think they can hear me if I'm not, if I'm unmuted. 
I think I don't think they can hear you if I'm if you're is your mic on? It isn't right now. Oh, it is right now because I'm going to switch to another. Your mic needs to stay on. Okay. Your mic needs to stay off. <laughs> your speaker needs to stay on. And they can still hear it. They can still... <laughs> that mic is on. Yes, they can. Okay. okay. I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, so this next one that I'm going to share is a um, is a, by. Um, Heinrich Isaac and it's Innsbruck ich muss dich lassen and you'll see the actual music so you can see because it's polyphonic it has more than one melody or it has yeah and it's gonna it's gonna be phrased so it's start you'll see rests where it'll make it it'll be one line and then there'll be a rest but it's got more it's got four voices going at the same time and this is a very popular song still sung in Germany um, and he wrote it in, you know, right around uh, 1500. So this is Heinrich Isaac. Oh, the last one was just Gandupe. Okay. So he was French. Yeah. Okay. So French. No. Anyway. Okay. So <laughs> this one is, this one is um, going to be uh, the a German um, composer. If I can find out oh, there it is. And you'll be able to watch the music as it is as it plays. Here we go. I think. And then there's a break. these guys okay I, oops i guess nope this is this is just popular music this is just pop music that was more of a sad obviously i guess the french were happier or something el grillo was a little bit more but this one or i guess he was um portuguese spanish anyway the um german one is all kind of about longing and um, yeah, so it's, it's, I have to leave you in my favorite city and yeah, so that was it and, and the way that composers lived was either they could be hired, they could have a patron and as in the church. So both of these guys wrote music for the church as well. Um, you know, wrote some liturgy or, and they would be assigned uh, pa passages to write about. Um, or they could work for a king, one of those little princes. And, you know, obviously, um, Isaac here wrote for uh, the guy who's had Innsbruck as their, as his main, main uh, so yeah, so it was, they were very, they were very um, tied to who their patron would be, whether it was the church or not. And they could, you know, travel around and find a patron that way, uh, musicians at the time. So uh, the thing is, is that already you can see people, um, the church was really married to the idea of using Latin. Well, meanwhile, in society, people were enjoying music in their own vernacular, in the, in the, the songs um, that were surrounding them. And Martin Luther loved music, loved singing, um, was somebody that said um, he, was, he liked the sound that you just heard. This, this was a like you know popular song at the time. Um, he liked that sound of um, the of more than one melody, you know, the melody line coming through. Yeah. So does anybody have any comments or if you know more about music than I do, you can throw it in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a couple things kind of. Um, I've, I don't have a strong music background. I love listening to music. And that, yeah. That makes sound very soothing. Yeah. And. Some of the comments that were shared earlier. I mean, one one thought was, you know, one thing that I thought was very important for Martin Luther was that he that he translate, you know, Latin into 
the Bible. Oh, yeah. The Bible into German. Yeah. And I could also see him thinking that, you know, I want to translate all these songs yeah. know, into German or, or other. <laughs> Um, can you hold that spot oh. for a second? They're not able to hear you right now, so I think we I have oh. to unmute. Oh, I should unmute myself, maybe. And then you have to mute. And okay. I, gotta, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, I can I, hear I can hear everybody in the room. Oh, so, yeah. Oh. Billy, Billy was not able. To okay. Me. Well, maybe I'll just unmute. Just mute yourself again. And I can. I, I don't can, hear. Okay, I can recap. I can recap for you, Billy. He was just talking about how important the the translation that Luther did of the Bible into German, and how the songs that maybe were of you know around the sound of the music also also played a role in his you know in his interest in music. And because he was interested in all these different facets of music, I think maybe that one is one of your points, right? right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they can hear him. But... I, I can recap. Okay. So if you go ahead and talk. I, I like, I like to listen to Christian contemporary radio stations. And yeah. I obviously, you know, kind of draw myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I was equally kind of uh, uh, enjoyed listening to the singers that actually could sing in Spanish and yeah. you know maybe a different language. Yeah. So my thought is, the more I listen to, especially if the singer was able to to dynamically sing two versions, like Christmas songs, yeah, that, you know, with that same tune, yeah, and you know, I'm trying to put myself into that congregation or that that mass, yeah, and I I think the music in itself becomes you know God speaking to me. That's true. Yeah, and and I think. For me, um, my relationship with God is so strongly rooted to music. Yeah. And because I I don't pray enough, I should pray more. <laughs> yeah. But I, I sing probably more. Yeah. 20, you know. Yeah. And I'm kind of like you. The point he's making is that even the people like sitting within the mass, hearing hearing the Latin over and over, there is a music speaks to um to people in a really profound way i think is kind right. of one of your points that it isn't even just whether you're actually singing it sometimes even just taking it and god can be speaking to you through that music and whether and then for some people it, it is a, a way of praying that it becomes kind of a, a, pr a prayer and i think for luther this was especially true and i have some quotes um, that actually um, he said was that music is next to theology so that for him, the the, the new um, the idea that you could uh, bring more more people to God through music played a big role, and it it, it is different than other reformers, other like um, John Calvin. He really felt like you should limit the amount of music that is in worship, and then Ulrich Zwingli, which is another. A reformer from from Switzerland, he actually thought that music had no place in worship. So there's a, there's a there was a profound kind of um, there was some discourse going on. These guys were brief right around the same time, a little bit later than Luther, but there was discourse going on as to what what role music should play within worship. That became um, became pretty clear. And yeah. Luther I'm swinging back to yeah. the I'm wondering what role women played in any of this, including the singing. I'm I'm not a diva, diva <laughs> but I do sing tenor. Yeah. And I was hearing multiple voices that are being sung by men. Yeah. If yeah. You don't have any tenors, you're gonna only have one line. Right, exactly. So are there any women that were singing back then, or is that the only way you can no. get more than one voice? Okay, very question, good question. So you had a question about if you have polyph polyphonic music and you have different voices, how do you get the higher voices if you don't have women? Well, they would um, have, remember, you know, boys would get sent off to the monastery often as well. So they would have younger children um, within the monastery that could sing higher notes, at, but women were not involved at all. And in fact, it wasn't considered a mass unless you had a priest. So the priest would have to be assigned to a convent. Now, in the convent, if it was a group of women alone, they could 
celebrate mass and they could sing as a part of their um, offices, the offices that they would need to do. But it would have to, they, in order for it to be a mass with the full liturgy, they would have to have a, a priest there. And the priests would have to kind of go around to these different convents to kind of deign to get, bring the, you know, the, the, the high church in. Otherwise the women were um, would were still required to do the different offices of the day if they were like Benedictines or Augustinians. Um, they would need to do their various offices. That's part of what you're required to do as a religious person. Um, so it because honestly, the view was that the 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 religious, so the nuns, the monks, they really carried the community, that they were the intercessors really between those, the people that were standing there that were required to come to mass, then they, they were, they carried the burdens of the community and brought it forward to God more or less. So um, yeah, they, they were still required to do all the offices, but they wouldn't be able to have a true mass unless they actually had a priest that could celebrate it with them. So that was a very different type of societal pressure there. Um, interestingly enough, I asked, one of my questions was what, what inspired Luther to write music? Because he started to write his own music. And that um, kind of brings up the whole idea of how important he felt it was to um, to the, the worshiping community. Um, and that he felt like he was bringing, it was bringing um, a, message. a message in. Um, and his, um, so I was kind of curious about that. And I asked, I kind of did some reading and then um, Eric was kind of, kind of talked about it too. Um, his, uh, he was inspired by that um, secular music that we just heard. The, like Innsbruck um, song, and even some others, Josquin Dupré, those were very um, popular uh, songs of the day, um, having that, uh, those different voices coming in. The interesting thing about if you have, of course, if you have um, included music into the mass or mu music into the worship service, but people can't read, then you have to teach them the songs or they have to start to be able to understand and read um, their own language. So bringing the ger bringing German into the 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 actual service itself was a kind of a re revolutionary idea because it also encourages people to either learn to read or the they are learning new music, and it's a way of also kind of teaching. Um, so I in asking the question like what inspired him, what inspired him to really write music. Um, the first song that he wrote was actually just an, I think an emotional reaction to a tragedy. And that was, um, he wrote a song called Ein Neues Lied wir Hayden an, um, which is a new song we're, we're bringing forth kind of. And it um, was in 1523. So re relatively like only seven years after the theses. And he had um, said he was not gonna recant in 1521. He wound up um, in getting his New Testament published in German in 15, right around then 1522. In 1523, um, a, uh, two monks, two Augustinian monks actually were executed for not recanting their Lutheran views in Brussels. So up in Belgium, there were uh, there was a small group of Augustinian. So his brothers from his own order um, had uh, started being more Lutheran, being more following more what Luther's ideas were. They were all five of them arrested. Three of them recanted. Two of them that did, did not, um, and were burned at the stake. That was Jan van Essen and Hendrik Voss. So they were the first, considered the first martyrs of um, Lutheranism or the Protestant That's faith. Kind of pills, actually. I know. <laughs> so, so he wrote, so he actually wrote a hymn in their honor and, in, and as a reaction, his own, like, just, I think he was, I think it was just such a terrible thing, such a shocking thing for him that he did write a, um, a hymn. And this was his first hymn 
that he wrote in 15, and he did the music and the, and the lyrics to it. Um, and here I can share that with you as well here, just a little snippet. I know we're gonna run out of time. 1520 what? 1523 is when they um, were, um, were executed. So here is a little piece of the song he wrote in their honor um, as martyrs. I mean, there are other Protestant martyrs like Jan Hus, people could say was a, a martyr for Protest, for, for you know, reforming the Catholic church. But these guys were um, the first ones from that were following Luther's views. <laughs> Uh, leaders yeah perfectly. right they did not have they were over in Belgium exactly and that's a very Catholic area so they did not have we talked about how Luther had some protectors and the, you know that took him to the Wartburg he was able to translate the Bible in disguise mm -hmm. uh, because he was a wanted he was an outlaw he was wanted by them so he could easily have been martyred as well but this is these are the first ones that were following his um, and were his brothers from the Augustinian order Yeah, he put it on YouTube. So this is a little, here you can read the story of the outfit at full screen. Oops, sorry. You can read the little story here as well. This was actually done in Antwerp as part of the 500th anniversary. This, this particular version. That's just a snippet. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I have to speak at the second. Okay. Service. So go ahead and do your and, thing. And I'd like to just have five minutes. Yes. To cover what Pastor Sue is coming in, coming in an hour. <laughs> Can we just pass these? Oh. Yeah. And while you're just doing that, I just wanted to let you know that this little, this piece, you can kind of hear that, that popular music, yeah. how it was, how the melody was similar to that. Yeah. I have another example. Uh, I want to copy this. It wasn't written by Luther, but this is oh, it's, it's wonderful. Very covered. The Lenten hymn awesome. that we have, Oh Sacred Head Now no, Wounded. Did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, originally, the words were, uh, My heart is full of longing. For the love of a fair young maiden, yeah, that was sung in bars. Yeah, yeah, it was the bar song. So they knew the the, the melody. Yeah. So so that was the strategy. Since they know the melody, let's write. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. The other thing yeah. was that uh, um, the difference between Luther and uh, other Protestant reformers in the liturgy. Luther said. We will take from cut out of the mass only the things that are contrary to scripture. Yeah. Like uh, oh. in the, and we'll keep the rest. So so today Lutheran liturgy is very similar to the Catholic liturgy. It is, yeah. You know, but an illustration would be the role of the priest in communion is yeah. understood differently. The priest in the Catholic Church transforms yeah. the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. That was taken out. Luther said that's not scriptural. Right. Yeah. So it came to them that our disagreement with the other Protestants. Luther said, We will keep everything in the Mass except what is contrary to scripture. They said, No, we're going to include the worship 
only that which is commanded by scripture. Oh. So it, it becomes a yeah, two different uh, things. Yep. Yeah. And uh yeah, those are the things I was just going to sure. mention quickly. I'm sorry yeah. I have to leave. That's all right. Uh, this is what Pastor Sue was talking about. You can look at the chart. It's a chart of how we're our giving currently is to Calvary. And uh, on the back is uh, the emphasis is on, uh, on um, proportional. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. it's possible they're unable to they're not really hearing oh well. okay here you can come why don't you come sit right here and fit, do your part and then i'll come back all right all right because then i think you can hear better if he's from here right Well, as I said, Pastor Sue is taking an hour to what I'm going to try to cover in five minutes here. <laughs> uh, but I have a chart showing our giving. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have time, even though it's really interesting. And then uh, this is an updated financial pledge card. There will also be an updated time and talents pledge card but uh you're invited to think about and pray about and toward the end of october respond with a a pledge card like this one the uh if you look on the the second page where it says up in the upper right hand corner give boldly stewardship of love you were in church this morning, you heard about that. And uh, the uh, we have uh, examples of giving, our traditional giving, either the offering envelope or mailing it in or electronic giving or, and then a second offering every month. And then there are times for special giving. One of the things that I'm interested in is being sure that if you are a Thrivent member, uh, Thrivent provides grants without any charge to you for work of the church. We would like to know who Thrivent members are. Uh, let us know on your pledge card. If, uh, if you are older than 70 and a half, like I am, and have IRA accounts, you can have your IRA accounts directed directly to the church in a way that reduces your taxable income without costing you anything. That can be done. Uh, I have emphasized uh, uh, including uh, the church in your estate planning and in memorials or in special gifts. And uh, There will be a separate time and talent pledge card like this one, but we encourage you to look at this, think carefully and carefully about it, and then uh, respond so we will know. And uh, <clears throat> included in the pledge card this year is if there are things you would like to talk about with somebody, like for example, I don't really understand rebel giving. I went to the office and they helped me do it. This year, I want to increase my rebel giving uh, because uh, I'm on Social Security and I know my Social Security is going to go up. So I should give uh, increase my proportion. I don't know how to do that. I'm going to have to get somebody in the office to coach me. So these are just a few things. As you get the mailings from our church, please look at them carefully and uh, respond prayerfully. And uh, thank you, and I apologize for <laughs> interrupting this. Pastor Ron, yes. there's a, um, a question from a Zoomer. Um, will these forms be available online? Um, I think they will be, but they will be mailed to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
yeah, it is really important to support the work of the church. And um, so I think Luther would agree that it's important to, to do that. So um, we were in the middle of kind of talking a little bit about the, um, and so I have this little handout for you and I'll share that screen with you as well. Um, I just wanted to talk about that inspiration. We, his first hymn was written as a response to this terrible, terrible um, thing that happened. Then that, and I, this is kind of my last point. My other, the other things that were um, important to Luther, and I'm gonna share the screen for those of you that are um, in Zoom land. This is a little handout that I gave you. It's got on one side, a mighty fortress is our God, um, which is Ein Feste Burg. Um, and the other uh, side in German, and the other side is from heaven above. So it's the Chris, a Christmas song. And the reason why I wanted to point out these two songs was that for Martin Luther, um, you know, events of the day, like we just heard, can inspire him to write some music. But of course, the Bible inspired him. So um, the and from heaven above is obviously it's a Christmas song. It kind of retells the story from the perspective of the angels. So it is from um, the from the book of Luke, chapter two, verses ten through twelve. So it's from the it's from the Christmas story where the angels come and say, you know, and the angel said to them, "Be not afraid, for behold." I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all people. And um, this Christmas song is talking about that, how God has sent good news to all people, not just the ones that are singing up in the, you know, with the monastery or whatever, but for all people. And Luther truly, I think, believed that. He, and he highlights it by writing a hymn for, um, based on that, a Christmas hymn. Yeah. And then the other one that I have, and I had never, I've heard of Mighty Fortress is Our God, you know, a million times, especially Reformation Sunday, but it's based on Psalm 46, where um, Luther writes, um, so for, oh, Zoomers, I forgot to move to the second page. Well, now we're on a Mighty Fortress is Our God, um, and it's in German, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott. And we heard yesterday, or yesterday, last week from Martin about the difference between a Burg and a Schloss. A Burg is a fortress. A Burg is a fortress. And it is a citadel, more or less. It's something that is un, supposedly unshakable. And in Psalm 46, it talks about God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I think, and it also says, we will not fear though the earth should change. He, he's writing in this hymn based on the experiences of the common people around him. He's interpreting the Psalm to help them understand the, the strength based on their own culture, right? That this, this idea of um, people would live near a fortress and if they were under siege, they could go into this castle and be secure and be safe. So a form of, anxiety. A form of, of helping people to understand that this is directly out of the, you know, Psalms, the book of Psalms. So it's biblical and he is very, he's saying, he's interpreting that for them for their time and telling them that God is a refuge for, for all people and keep. And so I've always wondered about it because it seems very kind of militaristic, this whole mighty fortress and it's all about power and it's all about, it seems very, I don't know. But it, when I think if we were listening to it as um, people from the you know, 1500 and even today, it is, it's talking to them in their, not only their own language, because it's in German, but also with an understanding for what would make them feel secure, okay. you know? So, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those things. And I, the last thing, I know we're running out of time. The last thing is for Luther, the most important stuff, even with his music, were the five solas, which is in Latin, it's sola gratia, which means grace alone. For him, the idea of grace alone you know, justifies us with God. So sola gratia, sola fide, which is faith alone. Faith alone, sola fide. Solus Christus in Jesus Christ alone, that, that Christ is the redeemer. 
Um, he also, he talked about these five things for, and that's what I think Pastor Ron was talking about when he talked about how the stuff that they, you know, kind of jettisoned out of the mass and what they kept. Um, the other one was sola scriptura in scripture alone. Yep. And then solo, soli deo gloria for the glory of God alone. So those four or five items, four sola, five solas were um, critical in how Luther viewed what he wanted to do with the worship service. So it's grace alone, faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, based on scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Did that come from Luther, like five solas, or did that come from? That is, the, that is kind of one of the, the things that, um, as I understand it, one of the things that he highlighted most, each one of these separately, but then as a an overview, that's kind of what he was looking at in within the worship service. So it became very important for people to be able to understand and know what was being said. So it was a revolution in that regard. Yeah. Romans 3, um, Romans 321 mm -hmm. was the scripture that Luther said he was reading when he had his aha moment mm -hmm. as he was teaching the scripture. And it talks about a righteousness apart from the law that comes by faith. Yeah. And I was just looking that up. It's like a lot of differences. Like he never intended to start a new right. religion. He was trying to correct the teaching of the church. And so the um, the Catholic mass was understood as a representing or an offering to God. Yeah. And Luther was correcting that and saying, no, that's not what it is. Even though we still have the for you and the bread and wine. Mm -hmm. It's Christ giving to us. It's not us giving something to God. Right. Yeah. And like that's something that humanity has struggled with from that time <laughs> up to this time. It's very true. Yeah. I struggle with it. We all struggle with it. Hearing a word from God that's separate from this idea of a law that we need to do something to justify ourselves. Right. And that's his key thing. Like, and he was trying to communicate this to people. Yeah. Like, he was trying to release people from feeling that they needed to do something. For so, he's doing that same thing that music. Does. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for reinforcing that. Yeah. 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 I think that's what his. Um, we the we've been hearing a little bit now about how um, the inspiration that that um, that Luther had from Scripture to um, communicate with people the importance of not being looking at it as um, as worship being for God, but that worship is actually us receiving from God this um, the blessings of the of the grace that he is able to present to us through through the worship service and how and within the community of other people. I think that's another thing that I, I think Luther wanted to maintain. He didn't want to necessarily like you were saying, you know, say well you know you don't we don't need worship he wants to say that we are um together um you know a community of faith that that is um that is tied together by uh this this act of of worship so and and service to each other as well as yeah, okay. division. yeah exactly so i think he was really wanting to reform it not necessarily say i'm going to start this new church it's going to be completely but he had these these things that became crystal clear to him these five ideas that really meant for him um what was important so grace alone faith alone in christ alone scripture alone and to the glory of god alone so so there you go. Great message. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody have any comments or um, questions? I'm. We're still here picking up, cleaning up. I'm inspired to learn more. Okay, about Luther and his. Yeah. Oh, amazing! I didn't realize it was so <clears throat> part of the theology that we understand. Yeah. How about you, Zoomers? Are you? Do you have any questions? How many hymns did he write? Would you say? Oh, a lot. And I can't even tell you how many because it goes. And I didn't even get to the next part. Like, what did he inspire? What came back after that? So it went almost to this point where it became all music. But because um, Johann Sebastian Bach, about 100 years after Luther in his same area, also lived in Saxony, the same area. Um, Bach um, is born in Eisenach. He winds up in Leipzig. He writes um, actual whole 
whole services, cantatas, that are, it's all music. And he takes Luther hymns and weaves them into, um, yeah, I have a whole, <laughs> I have a whole, I have two more things to show you. I have a whole thing about how Bach got inspired by, and he is, they call him the fifth apostle because he brought so many people in based just because of his music. His, um, his music is very complex, polyphonic, was very ahead of its time um, and uh, created whole services and oratorios, which were more, um, you know, had all parts of them, of the, the service in it as well. Um, and those- it was, it was huge and it became, um, well, I can actually, if you want to listen to, so this is one of Luther's hymns that was changed. Um, here's the cantata version of Ein Feste Burg. We know it as Ein Feste Burg. Yeah, well, we didn't know it in English. A mighty fortress is our God. Yeah, that's Luther wrote the music and the words. A bulwark never failing. So here's what Bach did with it a hundred years later. If you want to hear it, let me see if I can share it. If we do we still have Zoomers that are with us? I don't know. Yep. Yes. Okay, you want to hear it? All right. Yes, yes. I'll put it on. This is what Bach made out of Ein, Ein Festiborg. So he he weaves a lot of uh, variation into it, but um, by then and then at the end it'll kind of all come together and be the familiar more. The, you, you can hear that familiar melody if you know you're listening to the different parts as it comes through. It'll come in and then it'll then he'll weave a whole bunch of stuff around it and then it comes in again and um, he kind of pulls out this longer piece, but it um, it really kind of at the time really hit the people as um, and brought in a lot of uh, people interested in in the service. So he makes these cantatas there um, and bases quite a few of them actually on Luther's original, very kind of renaissance -y coming out of the Renaissance um, music. So if you're a music historian, it's very, it's interesting to see the, the different weavings and how that kind of comes together. So there you go. Very cool. Oh yeah, he he comes comes from a very musical family in Eisenach. He also had a bunch of kids that were musical, um, and he was an organist. So he, but his method of he does a lot of that of the the type of music that you they hear where he brings in different parts at different times, um, and. Um, but yeah, still sung today. A lot of his oratorios, the St. Matthew Passion, he bases also on the Bible and then he'll 
write music and he borrows like from Luther and different places to and like Pastor Ron was saying, you know, even some popular bar songs, you know, get rewritten as hymns. So was he a Lutheran? Mm -hmm. He was a Protestant. Yeah. Yeah. Evangelische Kirche. Yeah. So. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in that clip you just showed, obviously it's contemporary, um, like an orchestra and choir. Yes. Uh, but the lute was, the lute and the flute were um, in Luther's time. In Bach's time, did they have violins and things, or was that later on? No, Bach was a, a Baroque composer, and he, yes, he started, he had, um, he had a, uh, I guess I could turn my camera off because I'm up there. Um, he um, had, at his resources, he had a lot of things, but it was, um, so he had all the string instruments, pretty much. He had some of the brass, some of the woodwinds. He did not have piano. Piano doesn't get invented until the um, Romantic era. So mm -hmm. everything you hear a lot of harpsichord. If you hear anything, it will be uh, it'll be a harpsichord. Mm -hmm. um, and so his uh, what was available to Bach at his time was organ, harpsichord, strings, some woodwinds. So they're they're slightly different than what we have today. There are Baroque versions, and if you there are groups in the um, I think a group came up a year or two ago here from the cities that played Baroque instruments. The Bach Society in Minneapolis um, usually uses Baroque music or Baroque instruments as well. So they're slightly, I, they're tuned differently, some of them. So yeah. Yeah, because I, I play clarinet and I know that Mozart was like that the, the modern day clarinet sort of came out in the 1700s, right? Right, and yeah. He was like, that's why there's a lot of, um, for me, that was, you know, like my guy because he sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And so he developed music that way. Different yeah. sounds appeal to different eras. So, uh -huh. um, and I think Mozart, yeah, some of the, so early woodwinds, so the precursor maybe to a clarinet would be available to Bach, but not what we know today as a clarinet. So you have to go and you, it's really interesting that like the I think there's one called the Rose Society down in the cities. They do um, they do vocals as well, but the Box Society. Well, I guess the Box Society does too. Um, they kind of teamed up with Cantus, the group that the the group of male, men singers that you heard do El, El Grillo. They um, they teamed up with the Box Society and did a whole thing on Baroque music um, a couple of, a year ago or two maybe here. So you can watch for that. Yeah, you cool. The man you played had um, was accompanied by a the old agamba yeah which was the predecessor to the cello yes so yeah. that, that it's like instead of four strings it's five strings yeah and it has some frets yeah and it doesn't have an end pin so you have to spend your whole time holding it between your night and your, <laughs> the old agamba <laughs> And a, and a recorder they which is the other on that particular that was the innsbruck song there was a viola gamba and a um and a recorder and would win. The only reason I know that is because I saw Gamba in there. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't hear it. But Maddie, um, my daughter, is a cello player. And yeah. Maddie bumped into somebody. I can't remember how the connection was, but there's a the old Gamba Society in the U.S. Yeah. And she connected with this lady in the Twin Cities who lent her a Gamba. So she had it for about a year during the pandemic. Oh, oh fun. So she learned... Some of that, yeah. I learned some of it and had yeah. it around the house and was playing a little bit. It's, really <laughs> it's interesting. It's really fun. Interesting. So there you go. I'm sorry to keep you over, I guess, but um, if you had anybody have any more questions on Zoom land, are you all good? Good. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yes. We, we may have to do that for a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, you guys. That was great. Thank you.